Chinese Religion Part 8, The Six Dynasties. The Six Dynasties are the collective name for a period of chaos that followed the end of the Han Dynasty. The earlier part of the Six Dynasties is known as the Three States or the Three Kingdoms. This lasted from 220 to 280 CE. During this time, the country was divided between three main kingdoms. Following the Three Kingdoms period was the Jin Dynasty, which did succeed in uh, partially reunifying China, but it did not last for very long, and there were still a lot of invasions and fairly chaotic circumstances. Following the Jin were the Northern and Southern Dynasties, in which the country was again divided into numerous states, including uh, one Northern and Southern Kingdom that had the pretense or the claim to authority over all of China. During this period, Confucianism lost the official government support that it had enjoyed under the Han. It never went away, and indeed it would come back to be even more influential than ever in later periods. But Taoism and Buddhism grew in relative influence during this period. Xuan Shui is a type of Taoism. The name literally means deep, profound, or mysterious learning. One of the founders of Xuan Shui was Wang Bi. He's a very famous scholar. He studied both Taoist and Confucian texts, as was common for all scholars. And he wrote very influential commentaries on the Tao Te Ching, the Yi Jing, and on the Confucian Analects. So, the term profound learning, which is also referred to as neo Taoism by scholars because it was a revival of the earlier philosophical Taoism, but that term is a reference to the idea that they were turning away, or these scholars were interested less in the religious aspects of Taoism, which had grown up during the Han, and were more trying to derive the original philosophy. So, Themes such as the nature of being or the source of being and the nature of emptiness and their relation to the Tao. Naturalness or spontaneity as a kind of ideal state. The relation between language and reality, a theme um, explored in the Chuang Tzu and in the Tao Te Ching. The nature of a sage or supremely wise person. These were all themes of interest to Wang Bi and other Xuan Shui uh, philosophers. So this movement actually helped revive interest in Taoism after Confucianism had become predominant during the Han. One of uh, Wang Bi's contributions was the concept of Li or principle. This was a way of talking about the fundamental nature of reality. And that was something that was kind of gestured at in texts such as the Tao Te Ching but Wang Bi and other Xuan Shui uh, scholars explored the idea of the nature of reality more systematically and talked about the way in which a sage can grasp the Li or principle at the root of things. The seven sages of the bamboo grove were contemporaries of Wang Bi and also part of this Xuan Shui uh, school of Taoism. They are renowned for their eccentric, bizarre behavior. You could look at them as kind of like bohemian or somewhat beatnik scholars, poets, artists. They would talk philosophy, sometimes get drunk on wine. Their approach was called Qing Tan or pure conversation. They were focused more on discussing metaphysics and the more abstract aspects of philosophy and avoiding politics and political philosophy. And they thought of the Tao Te Ching and other Taoist texts as giving a kind of more profound, deeper, metaphysical approach to philosophy that tried to get at the root of things, what was ultimately real. Go Hong uh, lived from 283 to 343. He was the author of a book called the Bao Pu Tzu. And this was a very influential text on Taoism and it also just influenced Chinese religion generally. It's divided into two main parts, the inner chapters and the outer chapters. The inner chapters deal with Taoist alchemy, with rituals of exorcism, 
um, instructions on how to attain visions of gods and of celestial realms, how to create talismans, fu or fulu, which give you basically uh, magical powers, protection, healing. These techniques were used by later Taoists uh, on the basis of this and other texts. The outer chapters are more about the relation between Taoism and other traditions. So um, they reconcile Taoism with Confucianism. So the way Ge Hong does this is that he regards Taoism as dealing with the inner realm and self-cultivation for longevity and immortality. Whereas Confucianism is directed towards society and politics, but you could look that, at them as kind of like a complementary yin-yang type relationship, the inner, the outer. He also reconciled Confucianism with legalism. So he thought that governing well requires a virtuous ruler. So he agreed with the Confucians on that. But he also liked the legalist principles of crafting law in the correct way and using significant rewards and punishments. So this was another precedent for kind of a synthesis of legalist and Confucian political philosophy that would become very influential on later generations of scholars. During the six dynasties, there was also the beginning of a Buddhist influence on Taoism. So Taoism during this period adopted certain beliefs and practices under the influence of Buddhism. Many, although not all, Taoist sects have some of these beliefs. Karma and rebirth became pretty universal in Chinese religion. So even though that was not the original teaching of the afterlife, there was a notion more that the immortal spirit might go to live in heaven with the ancestors or just merge with the energy from which it sprung. But now there is a doctrine of reincarnation and an elaborate cosmology of heaven realms, hell realms, etc., based on the Buddhist model. The Taoists also created orders of monks and nuns organized on similar lines to the Buddhist monasticism. You can see a picture on the right of a modern Taoist monk doing calligraphy with uh, water on a dusty floor. So there was also the custom of building temples. So these are large spaces for public worship, similar to the ones that had been built by Buddhists. This became common in Taoism as well. And even though Taoism had its own meditation practices, there was the introduction of certain meditation techniques that showed a Buddhist influence. The influence went both ways. So for example, in Chan Buddhism, some of their meditation forms were influenced by Taoism. Shang Qing, or Highest Clarity, was a Taoist sect founded by, according to tradition, Wei Huatsun. She was a female student of Taoism and a practitioner of Taoist meditation. According to Yang Shi, a later scholar, he received a revelation of scriptures from Wei Huatsun, who appeared to him as a kind of heavenly vision after she had passed away. There's some disagreement about whether Wei Huatsun was a real person or just a legendary person invented by Yang Shi or one of the other followers of this school, of this sect. Dao Hongjing was a still later scholar who compiled the scriptures revealed to Yang Shi into a canon or collection of sacred texts. This canon became the basis for the Shangqing sect. The goal of this sect of Taoism was to become a sage, a perfected person, Chen Ren, through practicing outer alchemy. And they also taught how to basically ascend your spirit to the heavens. Um, and they had various practices such as fasting to sort of cleanse your body and mind. This is an image of Wei Huatsun, and she's depicted similar in the way to a Taoist goddess would be depicted. Or they also talk in, in Taoism and Chinese religion about fairies or nature spirits, and that's kind of similar to how she was conceived. Ling Bao was another Taoist sect of the Six Dynasties period. It was founded by Ge Chao Fu, who was a descendant of Ge Hong, grandnephew, in fact. 
he received revelations from his ancestors about karma, rebirth, and cosmic cycles. So this is a major way in which these Buddhist beliefs became incorporated into religious Taoism. What the Ling Bao sect represents is a synthesis of Taoism and Buddhism. Another example of this Buddhist influence is the deity Yuan Shi Tian Zun, who was worshipped as essentially a supreme god by Ling Bao. He was regarded as wanting to bring humans to a state of liberation and peace. So the role he played in the sect is similar to that of the Pure Land Buddha Amitwofo in Pure Land Buddhism. So there are many reasons for the popularity of Buddhism during the six dynasties. This is the period in which it really spread and became prominent throughout all of China. One of the main reasons was the political instability. So this was sort of disrupting the previous institutions. Confucianism was no longer so predominant. It gave an opening for other traditions. Buddhism in particular was regarded as a kind of spiritual medicine for the pain, suffering uh, that was going on during the Six Dynasties period. The Buddha is often portrayed as a doctor who will heal your wounds, metaphorically cure your suffering. This was a sort of message of salvation that was very appreciated during the Six Dynasties period. The scholar class as well uh, eventually became somewhat interested in Buddhism because of the sophisticated philosophy and scholarship involved in Buddhist sutras and other texts. So the literati or the Ru class of China came to respect Buddhism just for its scholarly merits and credentials as something worthy of serious study. Um, there was also some fascination just in trying to understand and learn about the new religious concepts, samsara, nirvana, karma, the cosmology of heavens and hells. It provided a kind of a lot of ideas to chew on, satisfy intellectual curiosity. There was also a kind of inherent appeal to the colorful, elaborate Buddhist art and architecture in Buddhist temples. Painting, sculptures, and pagodas, these had a kind of cachet that could attract interest. The Sangha was also an appealing alternate community or family for people, especially those seeking refuge from the chaos of the Six Dynasties or those who had lost their own families. So in Chinese Buddhism, the Sangha often takes the place socially of the family in the Confucian tradition. So you worship your Dharma ancestors instead of your literal genetic ancestors, for example. And finally, um, Buddhism provided a religious vocation for women, which didn't exist for the most part in Taoism or other forms of traditional Chinese religion at that point. So Buddhism enabled women to become nuns or clergy before Taoism did. The picture on the right is the statue of the Bodhisattva Guan Yin, which is the Chinese name of Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. And this particular image dates from the Six Dynasties period. So at first, a lot of Chinese people um, emphasized or saw the similarities between Buddhism and Taoism. And some of these were genuine similarities. Some of them were somewhat misleading or superficial based on misinterpretation. So one example is the Taoist doctrine of emptiness or Shu was often compared to the Mahayana Buddhist doctrine of emptiness or Shunyata. In fact, Shunyata was a metaphysical doctrine about the lack of inherent existence or the interconnectedness of phenomena, whereas the Taoist emptiness or Shu originally referred to the lack of um, excess thought and desire in the heart of a sage, although it could also refer to the empty and flexible nature of the Tao itself, which is somewhat more similar to the Mahayana doctrine. The Taoist sage was regarded as free of excessive desires, and that seems similar to the fact that a Buddha or Arhant is free of craving and clinging. In Taoism, there's a lot of talk of balance or harmony of yin and yang, for example. Mahayana Buddhism talked about non-duality, although that was primarily a reference to shunyata as a lack of duality between seemingly different phenomena. 
In Taoism, there's a notion that the sage spontaneously, without force or effort, has care and compassion for other beings, which was similar to the Buddhist view of a Buddha, Bodhisattva, or Arhant having compassion for other beings. There was also a similarity between the Taoist and general Chinese notion of change in nature, as you can see in the Yi Jing, the Book of Changes. Yin and Yang were not thought of as static, but as always in a dynamic, changing relationship to each other. And that is similar to the Buddhist doctrine of impermanence. And finally, Wang Bi's Li, or principle, which is a way of referring to the fundamental fabric of the cosmos, if you will, was regarded as similar to the Mahayana doctrine of the perfect perfection of wisdom. This transcendental absolute that cannot be fully put into words, but can be perceived and acted upon by an enlightened person. Nevertheless, uh, there were also many critiques of Buddhism by both Confucians and Taoists as it became increasingly popular during the Sixth Dynasties period. One of the critiques is that the practice of celibacy by monks goes against Shao or filial piety because you're not continuing the line of your ancestors. You may, if you already had a wife, be leaving home. You're leaving your parents as well. So you're not being a very filial son, according to the Confucian view. There is also an interesting idea that the monk's practice of shaving their head harms the body. Um, the idea that you should not sacrifice a single hair on your body probably goes back to Yang Chu, founder of the school of Yang, Yang Jia. It became incorporated as a kind of tradition in just general Chinese culture that disfiguring your body in any way is a kind of subtle harm or disrespect to it. And so that particular custom of the Buddhist monks sort of rubbed some Confucians the wrong way. There was also a notion that withdrawing from the world into a monastery is shirking your responsibility, mainly to your family, but also to the political order or the broader society, which according to Confucianism, you do have a duty to promote uh, the welfare of society in the sense of being a good subject to the ruler or participating in government, things like that. Buddhism was also not mentioned in the Confucian five classics. So some people criticize Buddhism as not being worthy of study. It's not a part of the Confucian curriculum. And finally, Buddhist practices such as the contemplation of the bodily impurities. It's actually a theme of meditation which is supposed to decrease your attachment to the body, was regarded by many Confucians and Taoists alike as somewhat morbid or ghoulish. Mozart was an example of a prominent apologist for a defender of Buddhism. He was originally a Confucian before he converted to Buddhism. So he was well versed in the Confucian classics and the Confucian scholarship generally. So he was in a good position to respond to these criticisms. So, for example, Moza argued that the five classics also don't mention Lao Tzu or other sages that are regarded as enlightened beings or worthy models for emulation. And so the five classics can't be the only sources of wisdom. He also noted times in Confucian texts where Confucius is depicted as praising people who did not conform to the customs of Chinese society, such as Dai Bo of the Chou, who cut his hair and tattooed his body. Um, Confucius also would praise other conventional people, including people who didn't have families. So Mozart's attempt was basically to try to defend Buddhism, even from the perspective of Confucianism. You can see this attitude of instead of emphasizing the contradictions or the contrast between Buddhism and Confucianism, instead trying to reconcile them, which indeed many Chinese would go on to do. Six Dynasties Buddhism was characterized by different properties in the North and in the South. There was a bit of a division between North and South in China throughout this period. The Northern kingdoms tended to be closer to um, Central Asian nomads. So they faced more invasions there was also more intrigue and politics around the old imperial capital in the north. 
Northern Buddhism often emphasized the powers, the siddhis, that people who had developed their meditation. So the popular teachers were monks who had a reputation for being able to perform miracles or miraculous feats, such as clairvoyance, being able to see things far away, turn themselves invisible, etc. Northern Buddhism also was characterized by getting involved in politics, including some conspiracies against non-Han rulers who had invaded northern China and established a kingdom in the north. Southern Buddhism was influenced, in fact, by the Qing Dan, or Pure Conversation Movement. This had been um, started there or brought there by the scholar class of the old Han Kingdom, who moved to the south after the end of the Han Dynasty to escape some of the instability of the north. These were the foremost of the literati or Ru class, and many of them were interested in Qing Dan. So they brought this kind of literary approach to Buddhism when they became followers or students of Buddhism. Southern Buddhism was focusing more on sutra study and meditation or self-cultivation practice when compared to the North. Hinayana and Mahayana Buddhism were both present in Six Dynasties China. Hinayana was popularly more associated with meditation practice, whereas Mahayana was associated with the perfection of wisdom or qi. So perfection of wisdom sutras such as the Heart Sutra and Diamond Sutra became very popular because of the widespread perception that Mahayana was a deeper or more profound approach to Buddhism. It eventually became the predominant type of Buddhism in China. Kumara Jiva was an example of a very important person who transmitted Buddhism to China during this period. He was from a Central Asian kingdom, uh, perhaps of Turkish ethnicity. Uh, he translated many of the Mahayana Buddhist sutras from Sanskrit into Chinese. And these Chinese language versions of the sutras eventually became used not only throughout all China, but also in other parts of East Asia. This, of course, is a modern picture of Kumara Jiva from a film production, but it shows him holding his um, sacred texts. Uh, you can also see he's a Buddhist monk. He's wearing the robes and he has a shaven head. So a little bit more about the connection between Buddhism and politics during the six dynasties. Buddhism was sometimes politically controversial because the monks did not bow to kings or emperors. They were regarded as removed from the world so it was not considered appropriate for them to acknowledge or subject themselves to a worldly authority. Also, some Confucian scholar officials, people who had served in government, became Buddhist monks after retiring. Now, the Buddhist Sangha became somewhat prosperous by having a lot of lands and wealth donated to them by lay people for the sake of gaining merit or good karma. As they gained in power and wealth, this led to corruption and meddling in politics. One example of the blowback from this was Emperor Dai Wu of Northern Wei, who in 446 persecuted a lot of Buddhist monasteries. He claimed to have discover, discovered hidden caches of weapons in the monasteries and instances of men who had become monks to avoid his labor tax and force conscription into his armies. He also claimed to find monks who had lovers, so had, were not following their vows, and also monks who had profiteered by selling grain they had hoarded during times of famine. As a consequence, he used this to justify the burning of sutras, destruction of temples, and he also even sold many Buddhist monks of aristocratic lineage into slavery, which would have been a great disgrace for them. Um, in contrast, Emperor Wu of Liang gave political power to Buddhist monks and nuns because he was a follower of Buddhism and he persecuted Taoism. So you can see religion became a bit of a political football depending upon who was in charge at any given time. Finally, Emperor Wu of Northern Zhou persecuted both Buddhists and Taoists as he was a follower of Confucianism. 